There it goes. So I think we are ready, right? Okay. So uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today, uh, Dr. Nathan Newbery from uh, NIS, uh, National Institute of uh, Standard and Technology. So uh, Dr. Newbery leads the fiber source and application project at uh, uh, NIS Quantum Electronic and Photonic uh, Division. Uh, he received his uh, PhD from uh, Princeton University in uh, 92, uh, where he co-authored a textbook on physics problems, so you guys should learn from him. Uh, he worked at MIT Lincoln Lab uh, from 95 to uh, the year 2000, and has been uh, at NIST since uh, uh, the year 2000. So his research at NIST uh, uh, has focused on the development and application of fiber-based frequency combs. Uh, he has received um, the bronze uh, medal and silver medal, and also the Fleming Award from the Department of Commerce. Uh, he is a fellow of uh, the Optical Society of America. So, uh, welcome. Uh, he's going to. Okay, so he's going to talk to us about uh, his search for the application of the frequency combs. Okay. Uh, thanks, Khan, and th thanks for inviting me out here to speak. I uh, never visited Tucson or, or obviously the University of Arizona, so it's been a pleasure to come visit and, and see what's here. Uh, as Khan mentioned, I'm at NIST in Boulder. This is Boulder. The town of Boulder is kind of in the foreground, and NIST is this white building here, and these are the, the beginning of the Rockies. Um, and I'm, we're actually one of a number of groups in Boulder that works with frequency combs. And our group in particular works with fiber laser-based frequency combs, as I'll describe, both developing them and looking for applications, areas where the comb can really bring a, a benefit. And one of the things, as I'll talk about, that we're really pushing toward now is, is using the combs outside of the lab, uh, initially getting the light outside of the lab and then the comb. So a couple of experiments I'll talk about is actually sending some of the comb light from the NIST building up to a mirror on the mesa up here and back. It's sort of a two-kilometer link, which is just a, a convenient test bed for us to try out some different things. Uh, so I think some of you here are familiar with frequency combs, and there's a lot of work here done with them as well, but I thought I'll just briefly remind you what a frequency comb is, and in particular some of the properties that are important uh, to us for some of the applications we're looking at. And then I'll talk about three of the main applications we're kind of pursuing now. Uh, I'll, I'll spend the most time on molecular spectroscopy, and this is where we're taking advantage of the broadband uh, output of the comb to do precision spectroscopy, but more recently really to do monitoring of greenhouse gases, because we think the comb can serve a useful niche here to do accurate, precise mo measurements of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, then a little less time, but I'll talk some about comparing remote optical clocks. So this is the next generation of optical clocks are good at a part in 10 to the 18, and sort of timing jitters of femtoseconds. Uh, they're so good, it makes it very difficult to transfer their signals between them without having the signal degrade. And so we have a technique to do that over free space that, that looks promising, I'll talk about. Uh, and one way to think about this 10 to the minus 18 level is it's really the gravitational redshift you'd get if you took a clock and raised it one centimeter in the Earth's gravitational field. So this is you know, by far the most sensitive physical system that's around today. And then briefly at the end, mainly as an excuse to so, show some pretty pictures, I'll, I'll show some 3D surface imaging we've done at 10 meter range using a conventional LADAR system where the comb is really plugged into it to provide absolute NIST traceable calibration. Uh, and then of course very briefly at the end, I'll show you our latest comb. These were all done using a lab-based system. And our latest one, we finally got in the comb outside of the lab. And that's really the direction we want to head in. So I mean a comb, in some sense, you get a free writing comb directly out of any passively mode lock laser. Okay, so here's your simple laser cavity, and you have some saturable absorber, and you end up with a pulse that rattles around in the cavity. And every time it hits the output coupler, you get a pulse out, so you end up with a train of pulses. Uh, and maybe you spectrally broaden them, we often do. But this pulse train will be separated by a, a certain repetition rate, which is just the cavity round trip time. And that's, essentially, that's what you need to get a comb. Um, 
if you have this situation, then if you take the Fourier transform of this train of pulses, you end up with a comb of frequencies. So each of these lines represents one distinct optical frequency. And these teeth have to be separated by the repetition rate of the laser. If they weren't, you wouldn't get a pulse train out. So it's sort of a, a circular argument. And so the comb is described by the spacing. Now there's nothing that fixes the position of these teeth. They can drift back and forth. So you can march down, and now there's no light, but march down to the virtual tooth that's closest to zero, and you have an offset frequency. And basically, that defines the position of the comb. And if there were no perturbations and nothing else happened, you'd, you'd kind of be done. But of course, there's environmental perturbations, regular noise, uh, uh, ASE noise, and things that come in, and they mess up the comb. But the important thing is for a passively mode lock laser, they really don't mess up the comb structure. They make it breathe and translate. Um, and so basically it was that realization that you know, led to the, the Nobel Prize for Jan Hall and Ted Hench, which was, okay, let's just stabilize two degrees of freedom. The comb only moves in with two degrees of freedom. If we pin those down, the comb structure is fixed. So we bring in a clock, either in the RF or optical domain, and then you do the hard part, which is to detect this offset frequency where there's no light, but there's this F to 2F trick to detect it. And we phase lock that tooth down so now the comb can't slide. And then the other way thing we can do is then lock down the spacing between the teeth. But that actually leads to not such a great comb in terms of narrowness. And so what we normally do is actually do an optical phase lock loop and lock one tooth to a, a, a fixed laser, which might come from an optical clock. And for practical purposes for us, this is often actually a, a local product, an NP photonics laser that's locked to a high finesse cavity. Okay, And if this laser has a Hertz line width coming in, that Hertz line width is, covers all these teeth. And we basically end up with this comb, which is really looks like delta functions. Each of these teeth can be a Hertz or a sub-Hertz line width. And they're each at a well-known frequency. This is the now the classic formula, where this is the mode number n and the rep rate and the offset frequency. Uh, and in the time domain, if you have this, you know, it's important, it'll be important later for the optical clock to realize that then the pulse train, the spacing between the pulses, has sub femtosecond jitter. Okay? And the carrier phase is also well defined. So you kind of, depending on where you're working in the time or frequency domain, either you can take advantage of these narrow line width or, or sub femtosecond jitter. So, I mean, there's a lot of work here and a lot of work elsewhere that just pushes combs out. And the reason is, if you think of them as a source for sensing, they're really attractive. You've got a, up to a million phase coherent CW oscillators from one source. They don't have much power, but you know exactly what frequency they're at. Uh, and people have pushed combs out. Uh, Jason is pushing combs out this way, right? And there's a lot of people pushing combs out here. And, and Khan is, you know, has developed some really nice uh, uh, fiber lasers in here and comb sources. Continuous push, it's been automated. Uh, to simplify things, all I'm going to talk about is systems with erbium fiber laser based combs. And the reason is that we can access what we want to do in this wavelength region, and they're cheap, right? We can use telecom components to build them. This is our current, uh, a lot of the measurements were done with this kind of messy looking laser, which nevertheless can have these Hertz wide comb teeth. And I'll show at the end, we've kind of moved toward this even simpler linear cavity. Um, so I think sometimes we get caught up with the comb and the comb structure. I think I wanted to take a step back and say, what, what are the properties that make this special? And I think at some level, it's a combination of properties that make the comb useful. Okay, so basically the output of the comb is a very broad spectrum, you know, broad as in, not as broad as a light bulb, but very broad. And so that's important if we want to do molecular spectroscopy. Uh, the other thing is it's a laser beam, so it's spatially coherent and bright, so we can send it long distances, which is important for our two-kilometer path type measurements. Uh, and then, of course, it's not a continuum, but it's made up of discrete lines that, you know, we can make very narrow. They look like an RF tone if you look at them. So suddenly all the stuff you could do in the RF domain, or not all of it, but a lot of it you can start to translate to the optical domain. And it's really this combination of things that we use to greater or lesser extent in any system. Uh, so with that, I was going to turn toward the, the first topic, which is this molecular spectroscopy. Um, and really, what we're doing here is uh, 
is simple gas, linear gas absorption spectroscopy, which has been around forever because it's sensitive, specific, non-destructive, and so on. And it's a very simple idea, right? You're looking, uh, any molecule will have its own unique vibration rotational spectrum. Uh, so if you take a broadband light source and you pass it through a gas sample and you resolve that spectrum, and here's one for air, actually, uh, which we'll uh, show later, um, you can do things as a, to interrogate the sample. You can do some basic chemistry, sample analysis. It's obviously huge in combustion diagnostics and, and trace gas detection. Uh, and this is just gases. Of course, people do this with liquids and solids and so on. And the typical workhorse is the FTIR, which is incredibly well-developed, right, in all sorts of shapes and sizes with very broadband coverage. Uh, but at some level, it's based on very primitive technology. It has a lamp as the source, and the spectrometer is an interferometer with a moving mirror. Um, so it has some limitations. Uh, and the obvious thing that we want to do is say, well, can the comb, at least for some niche applications, provide enough performance increase that it's worth replacing the FTIR? In particular, the obvious thing to replace is the broadband light source and replace that with a comb. And there are a lot of ways you can replace, do spectroscopy with a comb. Many, many ways have been tried. I'm going to talk just about the one area that, that we've been pushing. But the basic idea is shown here. You take your comb, and so here's the comb teeth as a function of frequency, and this is not to scale. There'll be hundreds of thousands of them. And you pass it through a gas, and if there's gas absorption, you attenuate the teeth, right? And it's pretty simple. And now we want to detect that. The problem lies here that the comb tooth spacing might be 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz or maybe a gigahertz. That's pretty narrow. And so if you go into a typical grading spectrometer or a typical FTIR or even a more advanced uh, VIPA spectrometer, you're not going to fully resolve those teeth. So you're going to smear them all together. So right there, you've lost one of the main attributes of the frequency comb. You, you no longer have a frequency axis, right? You don't, there's nothing defining this anymore, whereas here, the teeth were well-defined. You still have a broadband light source, but you know, it was a lot of work to go through for that. Um, so we use the uh, dual, what's now called the dual comb spectroscopy approach. It's, if you're familiar with some of these other techniques, it's essentially similar to that. It just maybe is slightly more coherent. Um, and the idea is we're going to bring in a second comb to act essentially as a local oscillator, and I'll describe how that works in a minute. But the bottom line is it lets us read out the absorption uh, on a tooth-by-tooth -tooth basis and retain the full frequency axis of the comb. So it's really based on heterodyne detection that you're familiar with. But imagine you're doing heterodyne detection with two lasers. OK, so we bring them together. We beat them on a photodiode, and you get an RF bead out. So the amplitude of this bead is the product of the electric fields from the two lasers, right? The frequency of the bead is their difference in frequency, so we've mapped them down to the RF. And I want to mention that the phase of this RF field is the phase, relative phase, between the two lasers. Okay, so with a simple operation, we can look at this RF tooth, and its amplitude tells us about the product of their amplitudes and its phase, their phase difference. And if we know what frequencies these are, we know what frequency this is, or vice versa. So we just want to do that on a big scale. This is really all that dual comb detection amounts to. Uh, we take the combs, and I, I haven't emphasized it, but we can really phase lock these with all the control we want. We can move them around kind of at will, and so we do. Uh, we line them up, so one tooth is lined up on the other one. So now these are two CW lasers right at the same frequency. They beat together on a photodiode, you get zero hertz. But then we make the red comb here have a slightly higher uh, repetition rate, so its spacing locks out. Um, that means that this pair of, be this pair of uh, comb teeth at the photo down, you get a bead at the difference in rep rate. And this pair is a slightly larger difference and so on up the chain. So basically, this pairs of optical combs generate one RF comb. All right? And that's really all the, the basic technique amounts to. And the height of these RF teeth, again, is the product of the height of these, each pair of uh, relevant optical comb teeth. And if we satisfy Nyquist condition, if we bandwidth limit this appropriately, then we have an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between this tooth and one pair of optical teeth. And we know everything about these optical frequencies, so we exactly know where this should be, and we know that this RF frequency corresponds to this optical frequency. So we can get a perfect mapping between them. Um, 
And of course, we get it all in a single photodiode at the cost of a, a second frequency comb. But, um, so for spectroscopy, we put a gas in one comb, right? That attenuates these teeth, and we see that reflected in the RF teeth attenuation. And if it's in one tooth, it's, I don't know how to draw it. I've tried. It also rotates the phase of some of these comb teeth, and you'll see that phase rotation in the RF teeth. So this is an experiment we did a while back now to just demonstrate this sort of in its fullest form. Uh, we took two uh, fiber laser frequency combs and we put some hydrogen cyanide gas in one beam. Uh, not because we're excited about using hydrogen cyanide gas, but it, it has absorption lines right in the telecom band. Uh, and basically we combine the beams and we have this filter to satisfy Nyquist and then we detected it on the photodiode. And from the picture I just showed you, you'd expect to see the filter bandwidth, and then if there's a molecular absorption lines, we should see a dip here, and so the RF spectrum should show that, right? And we did the measurements, we see this, so this is actual data here, uh, and basically you see the shape of the RF filter, but the rest of it's this big blurry thing, so you might say, well, that's because you're in the optical, the comb teeth are jittering around, and, and this thing is blurred out. In fact, that's not the case, there's about 10,000, I forget, 10, 20,000 teeth in here, so if I blow up, if I zoom this in, by a factor of 10, first of all, here's a dip. That's a hydrogen cyanide absorption dip, just like this. And if I keep zooming in a factor of 100, you start to see it really is distinct teeth. Okay, and this is again the actual data, and I can keep zooming in 10,000 times. Here's a single tooth, which has a Hertz line, line width. And the reason it's a Hertz wide is we digitize for a second. So it's a transform limited experiment, although that's about the limit of the uh, relative optical line width of the teeth. Um, so we really do get this picture. So if I back up a little bit uh, and just zoom in 500, you can see the teeth across the resonance and you get this nice dip. Um, and then as I mentioned last slide, we know how to map from this RF frequency to the optical because we know everything about the phase locks. And so we just pick off the top point and we have the black curve, which is the transmission. So what we've done is we've measured the transmission, but we've done it with a perfectly calibrated frequency axis and without the need for a spectrometer or anything. Um, the other thing is, and again, it's hard to show except here, is that we can actually measure the phase of each of these RF teeth because we digitize the time signal, take its Fourier transform, you get amplitude and phase, and we can plot that phase, and over the resonance you get this classic uh, uh, sort of derivative phase uh, curve. So we can sort of go to town on this. Uh, uh, we can take in the lab, we can put a gas cell in and put a bunch of gas in. We put some uh, methane, some carbon dioxide, some acetylene, and of course there's always water for free. Uh, and we ran this in and we get this kind of spectrum. I'm now plotting absorbance here and phase here. And this looks like a spectrum you might get with another system except that uh, uh, in this case, there are actually half a million spectral elements here, and each one is precisely at a comb tooth. So each one is precisely defined. And the other thing that's different is we actually have the phase spectrum. Here's a blow-up of one of the acetylene lines. Uh, so the blue dots are what we measured, and the, the red is a fit to a Gaussian Doppler broadened profile, and the fit has no residuals. This is lost here, but it's at parts in four or 5,000 SNR, and the phase is similarly, you, can, you know what the phase should be for a Doppler broaden line and the fit is equally perfect. In fact, the SNR and the amplitude in the phase is identical because we're running essentially uh, near the shot noise or at least dominated by white noise. So why is this useful? Well, compared to an FTIR, we have incredibly high resolution, no instrument line shape, there's no moving parts, we have the absolute frequency axis. So if you're from NIST, you immediately say, well, I can do precision line shape measurements, precision line center measurements, all the precision spectroscopy you'd want to do. And we did a little bit, but we don't really want to do a lot because it gets, it gets a little boring after a while. Uh, and I'll show you where we headed with this. Uh, the other thing that's unique is this phase and amplitude spectrum, right? Which you don't normally get in a broadband sense. So we spent a while sort of thinking about the phase. What, what can you do with it? And, and here's one thing. We're still struggling with it. Uh, it is added information. But one thing is if you have an amplitude and phase of a response, Right, you can take an inverse Fourier transform of that and you get a time domain response. Or you can take a partial inverse Fourier transform and get a time frequency picture or a, a sonogram in more colloquial terms, um, which is what's shown here. So this is taking this, in this case, hydrogen cyanide data and doing that. 
So this is the frequency axis, and this is effective time, sort of uh, not the real lab laboratory time. It took a while to take this, but if we process it, we get frequency and, and essentially time here. And this white line here this, uh, is where the comb pulse comes in, right? It's very short. It covers a lot of frequencies. It's a bright line. Well, the comb pulse comes in the cell, and then the comb pulse leaves the cell. But what you've done is you've excited a lot of uh, dipoles, right? The molecules are vibrating dipoles. They're also rotating. So once the pulse leaves, they, they don't know it left. They continue to vibrate. And if they haven't moved out of their position, they're all vibrating in in together, and you get coherent forward scattered light. And so you get light after the pulse leaves, which is here. And in fact, it's the interference of that light with the input light, which effectively is what gives you an absorption spectrum. And long after the pulse leaves, these guys are still vibrating, but they're also tumbling and rotating. So they rotate out of phase with each other, but rotation is quantized. So every now and then they rotate back in phase, they're all lined up, and you get another essentially pulse in the coherent direction. And so you see that here, you see these lines. And this is pretty, it's known in the terahertz domain, right? You see this and they're called rotational recurrences. It's just what you'd expect. And you expect them to phase up pretty well out here again, which they do. Uh, it's just uh, you know, hard to normally see this out in the infrared. Uh, and there are other systems can try to do it, but this is very high precision sort of measurement of it. And it's entirely analogous with you hitting a hammer on a bell and letting it ring. And I don't know if this will work, but you can take, I'll see if this plays. This is so far the main application we found of the phase here, is you can take the uh, you can take the signal and I can divide it by I forget 10, 20,000 and turn it into acoustical signal and you can listen to what hydrogen cyanide whoops hydrogen cyanide would sound like if you could hear it, which I could play if my mouse had reappeared. Here it is. So that's what hydrogen ion, if you ever hear that, there's hydrogen cyanide. Right? <laughs> so for a while we thought, this is great. We're going to take a lot of molecules and have a bunch of ringtones and start our own app and, and retire. Uh, and then we decided maybe, maybe nobody really wants that. Um, so we, we switched gears. Uh, and, and partly, as I said, we, you know, we're in this. We should do precision measurements. But we, we, we switched gears to a bigger problem, which is greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, so you're probably well aware of this, as I just pulled this off of the website here. This is uh, the increase in carbon dioxide in the outdoor air in parts per million in the red. And it was flat, right? And then we have the Industrial Revolution. And now we're on this incredibly start sharp trajectory. This is an old plot. We've now crossed 400 parts per million of CO2 and well on the way to 1,000 parts per million. Um, methane, which is the, sort of the second most important gas, is Actually, if anything, even steeper here, it's coming up and it's pushing uh, uh, two parts per million or 2,000 parts per billion. Uh, the other thing here is uh, N2O, which we don't measure, so I <laughs> put it on here. Um, so basically, it's useful to measure this. And it's not enough to just say, look, there's a lot of CO2 out there. Accuracy matters, right? Because particularly in this field, people really care if you're getting the number right. Is it changing from year to year? Is it different in this place than that place? Um, and the minute accuracy matters, right, we, th we think, haha, the, the comb could be useful. And in fact, the reason, uh, what it really comes down to is what people are interested in doing is seeing sources and sinks of, of carbon dioxide. Uh, and so what you're really trying to do is look for small variations on this background 400 part per million level to see if a cloud has come from somewhere. And the way it's done now is people can do point sampling in a vehicle. So you can take a cavity ring down sensor really beautiful device in a box that's portable and you can fly it around or you can drive it around and you can map out the concentration in this case of methane. Um, the other way it's done is satellite based observations. This is column density of CO2 from the Japanese GOSAT mission and the US OCO2 mission launched uh, uh, earlier this summer um, and it's going to generate similar column densities. And so obviously we're saying, well, there's some room in the middle here, right? And there's approaches here, but nothing very satisfying so far. So maybe this dual comb spectrometer approach can provide kilometer scale open air path measurements of these gases in an eye safe way, autonomous continuously, and fill this region in and give you something on the kilometer scale, which is the relevant scale for regional transport models. The, that's the problem with the point sampler is it's too sensitive to local stuff. Um, 
So we, we did that experiment. Uh, this was done in collaboration with the NOAA group that does greenhouse gas monitoring. Uh, basically, we set up the dual comb spectrometer in the lab, and instead of passing through a gas cell, uh, we went out over a two-kilometer link to a mirror and back. And all we're doing is measuring the linear path of integrated absorption of CO2 and methane in water. Uh, it's just that we're doing it with an instrument that has no instrument distortion. So we should have a very accurate uh, measurement. And then we fit that to find the gas concentration. Um, the, uh, we launched the, the dual comb spectrometer I'll show in a minute is down in the lab. The light is launched out of, actually, in this experiment, it was a more primitive lab, but this lab up on the top of the NIST building that's called the penthouse lab, which sounds nice, but really it's just a derelict office space that we, we took over. Uh, and we launch out of these terminals, which are exactly what you use for free space comm, up to the Mesa, uh, where we have a mirror that we picked up off eBay that was uh, refurbished, recoded in 1952. Uh, and it's a nice 20-inch mirror. And we use a mirror more for historical reasons uh, from another experiment I'll show. This is sort of a project in itself. We initially had it up on the top of the mesa, but this is boulder, right? So it's a hill. So people are always running up the hill because that's what they do. They're always trying to run up in the mountains. And then they get up there and they want to stretch. <laughs> so they pushed on the mirror mount. So Bill would have signal and it would disappear and he'd look through the spotting scope and there'd be somebody doing calf stretches on the mirror mount. And then they'd stop and the light would come back. So we moved it down the hill and we put a little uh, wooden hut around it. Um, and then we ran into another problem because it's Boulder, so there's a lot of homeless guys around. So <laughs> homeless guy Zippy came here and he kind of moved in. And it wasn't big enough for him to sleep in, but he put his tanning oil and his Gatorade in there. Um, and we had to gently evict him before the federal police did because they're not as polite. Um, uh, so it's, there's always somebody messing with the mirror. Um, anyway, uh, now it's radio controls. We can track some of the pointing and keep this link going for a while with these new terminals. The, the dual comb spectrometer is shown here. Uh, it's complicated in the sense it's two combs. So the comb is a femtosecond laser. And we amplify it up. And we do a soliton compression in large mode area fiber uh, from OFS. Launch it in some HNLF fiber that uh, were kindly uh, given to us by Sumitomo. Um, and do some spectral shaping. And we do that with this comb as well. And they're phase locked together in the way I showed. We actually send them over fiber up to the lab, launch them out over the two-kilometer link, come back, and then at least the detection is simple. We just hit them on a photodiode. Um, and so this is the type of data you get. This was data taken over long-time data, so it was exquisite signal-to-noise ratio. This is about a close to three-hour data run under relatively uniform atmospheric conditions. And I'm plotting what really the measured intensity versus uh, wave number if you're a chemist or wavelength if you're a physicist or actually I should do hertz if you're used to frequency combs. But, um, and this overall shape here is the comb. This is our spectrally shaped comb. We didn't put any light out over the link here because there's nothing interesting. But we put some light out here because it, that's where methane absorption and water falls. And we sent some light out here because that's where carbon dioxide, H2O, and actually H HDO fall. Um, and the thing about this is there's 40,000 spectral points here, each known precisely. So this is extremely precise measurements of the atmospheric absorption modulated by the comb structure. And to show that, the shaded regions show kind of the density of the sampling points we're getting. So these simple lines are 4 gigahertz wide. And in this case, we're 100 megahertz sampling. But it's, it's just to emphasize that the data is really in these narrow dips that you probably don't notice. They're 10 to 15% down. That's where the gas absorption is. So we can enhance them. If we take out the comb shape and, and take the natural log of that, you get the absorbance. And, and so that's what's plotted here. This is the methane lines, about up to almost 20% absorption in some water. And this is the CO2 line that we're interested in, same band that the satellite systems use. As long as, as well as buried in here, if, you, if I blow up some regions, there's HDO line, there's an H2O line, uh, there's hot bands, all the different complexities you get of these molecular lines, most of which are ca ca characterized or cataloged in the HITRAN database, and so we can fit them out. And the fit's very good. You can't see it behind the blue line either here or here. You can see the residuals are below a half, a standard deviation below, a, well, corresponding about a part in 3,000 SNR. We can see there's some spikes on the residuals, which is because these line shapes are not well enough understood. Basically, 
the dual comb data outside is more precise, more accurate than the laboratory data that was used to generate these. Um, but that's, that's an average measurement. What we really want to do, right, is measure the, the gas absorption, the plumes. So we're out here. There's essentially a utility plant here. The, the road is here, and there's cars and stuff. So we expect methane carbon dioxide to waft through, right, in plumes, if, particularly if there's low wind where these plumes don't get broken up and mixed. So we wanted to measure the time dependence of what we saw here. Uh, and then we wanted some truth data. So our NOAA collaborators have these point sensors, which again are these really nice cavity ring down sensors. And we can put it in a hut that's near the mesa. You see there's no snow here, but the mirror is up here somewhere. Um, and nearby is his radio tower that's emitting 50 megawatts of power somewhere. Uh, so they were kind enough to turn that off. And then I don't know if you can see him. Then one of the NOAA guys, John Koffler, actually was certified to climb towers. So <laughs> he's a rock climber. The tower is this big, right? <laughs> so, but, he, you know, he likes to climb things. So he took a tube in his teeth, right, and climbed up the tower and, and put a tube up here, and it sucked the air down into the tower sensor. So it's at least near the, the beam path coming through. So that gave us some truth data. Um, and so this is what we see in June. So this is now doing all the fitting, extracting the gas concentration. And I should mention taking out the water vapor and normalizing to the true uh, background gas of air. And this is what you get for CO2. Our data is colored and the point sensor is black. And it goes from 0 to 400. And there's some wobbles. And here's methane up at about two parts per million in water. Of course, wanders around, depending if it's foggy or dry. And I can blow those up, and it's a little more interesting. So again, you see we agree with water quite well. With methane, the agreement is pretty good. And with CO2, it's pretty good. There's a bias on CO2 I took out. We made sure they agreed here where things were well mixed in air coming from the mountains. But you can see in here there's lots of stuff happening, particularly, well, two things. The point sensor is quieter. It has less fuzz. But it sees these local plumes. It sees a lot of these spiky things that the path guy doesn't necessarily see. Here's a classic example of it because it's sensitive to local stuff. And it has an overall bias in places that's higher than the path, particularly for CO2, not so much for methane. And that's really why the path average one is useful. You say, well, who's right? Well, maybe they're both right. But from the point of view of transport models, they're done on a grid that's a kilometer or two-kilometer scale. And the satellites measure on a two-kilometer scale grid. So you want your ground truth data to be on that same spatial scale to connect it. Uh, in, the, in the field, the people talk about uh, uh, representation errors, their way of saying that, but that the point sensors have too much variability because they're localized measurements. So there seems to be a lot of traction here to developing this to do this sort of regional monitoring with the obvious idea you'd have a hub and a couple of paths coming out, and depending on the way the wind direction went, you'd reconstruct where sources and sinks are. Um, so I think this is where we're headed, I, I, but I don't want to, we have a long way to go in terms of robust systems. Uh, and we'd like to go to the mid-infrared to look at more uh, isotopes. We did see HDO and 13CO2 here, but any other isotopes you can see is valuable. Uh, so that I was oh, going to completely switch topics to the uh, uh, optical clocks. Um, so all right, so I, so I looked on the web, and you can find everybody synchronizing their watches, which is essentially what we're doing. So this is actually Obama's first term. This is Mubarak and Netanyahu. So I don't know why they had to sync their watches, but it didn't, didn't work, whatever it was. Um, and then you can, apparently this is common. And then you find the Russians are doing the same thing. Right? <laughs> I find this one funny because Putin here isn't so into it, whereas he's really into the. <laughs> So that's really what we want to do, OK? Except instead of comparing wristwatches, we have two optical clocks. And we really want to compare the frequencies they're ticking. And the optical clocks are really, 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 really precise. All right? Um, optical clocks have advanced dramatically in even the last two years. In the last year, they just keep driving them down. So what is an optical clock? Basically, you take an atom or an ion and it find a very narrow transition and you lock a laser to it. Well, first you lock a laser to a cavity, and then you lock it to the atom. And the optical clock output is the optical frequency. Usually it's a quadrupled one micron laser, so maybe the output is a one micron laser whose frequency, who, uh, 100 terahertz, whatever frequency, is precisely well known. So you can think of it as ticking at 3 femtosecond. Exactly. Um, and the, the noise on this, if you compare two of them, is sub femtosecond level timing or 
accuracies now which are really down at the 10 to the minus, a few 10 to the minus 18 level in multiple systems. Um, this output isn't particularly useful in and of itself, so you always are going to bring a frequency comb in. You lock the comb to the CW laser, and you, one way to think about it then in the time domain is these pulses come out, and now they're ticking at a more man manageable, say, 5 or 10 nanosecond rate. But again, they have some fe sub-femtosecond jitter with respect to the clock. So you, we can faithfully get from the clock to this pulse train or to the other optical frequencies and compare things. So this is sort of, we have this tool. It's a great, uh, great tool to do things. Um, but we're going to have to actually get the signals from somewhere to somewhere else if you want to do anything outside of the lab. And that's where a problem comes in. Optical clocks are here. Actually, they're even lower now because they keep improving. And the long distance RF link capabilities, GPS phase or 2A RF, are up here. So you can't use the signals in a real system. So that's what we want to tackle here is, is basically that optical clocks need optical links. You can do this over fiber. We had done some measurements a while back, and now it's actually quite common, and Europe is pushing it hard. But you need a dark, dedicated fiber for that. And if you try to do that in the US, the cost is prohibitive. Um, so we want to look at the other way of connecting clocks, which is over the air or free space. Why do we want to do that? Well, one is just that if we build it, they will come argument is we have these great clocks. We should be using them for time frequency dissemination, and, and things will come of it. That's probably the most ambitious because that requires a global system, which will require ground to satellite optical comm that the signals can piggyback on. Um, there's a lot of interest in the, de the sensing or defense community because now you can have a synthetic array where you've shared timing frequency information. And, and so particularly for an active array, they could all you know, pulse at the same time or, or you could process the signals together. And the other obvious area is pseudo GPS. You, you can make a, a, an area that's in, uh, independent of jamming of GPS. Um, the other big area is one I mentioned earlier is this idea these clocks are so sensitive that if they're really accurate at 10 to minus 18, which none are quite there yet, if you lifted up a centimeter, you could measure that centimeter height. And so uh, in Dave Wineland's group, uh, Till and James, for example, did a measurement where they raised the clock 17 centimeters, two clocks, and they measured the shift, which is a really awkward way to measure a 17 centimeter shift, right? You have a ruler in the lab, but, but if the clocks are separate, if one's here and one's on a mountain, it's really, really hard to measure the gravitational potential difference over that kind of span. And the way it's done now is literally guys with poles and little g and walking along a flat road and measuring things and essentially doing a line integral of little g along the path. And this is an exhausting line integral. They move it a few kilometers a day, OK, over flat terrain. So geodesists, people that worry about gravitational potential, like this as a way to provide truth data. You wouldn't map out a whole area. That's done by GRACE, the satellite mission. But it could give you some truth points along the way. And of course, more exotically, uh, ESA, not so much NASA, I guess, has various uh, plan uh, uh, Space missions where you'd have optical clocks on satellites and you look at how they're moving and changing orbits to test special and general relativity. And then you need to compare the clocks again. So, so why is this a pain to do? Well, basically, these clocks are really precise, right? So, and the first order Doppler shift applies. So basically, if they move even 3 nanometers per second, you get a Doppler shift of a part in 10 to the 17. So they can't move by anything more than this, or you at least have to cancel it out. The other way to think is a femtosecond translates to 300 nanometer position shift. So if this clock is ticking and you look away and look back and it's moved 300 nanometers and you didn't see it move, uh, you're going to get a femtosecond shift. And what was the point of building this great clock? And of course, we want to do it through the air where the platform can move, leaves can block the beam, and you have fundamentally limited by turbulence, right? which you guys are all familiar with here from looking at the parking lot on a hot day. And it breaks the beam up. Right? This is a simulation, but the real data looks even worse in a way. So the beam's broken up. And this problem is true for optical free space comm, too. Here it's sort of compounded because in addition to this amplitude noise, you have uh, a piston noise. You have phase noise. So there's basically a variation in the effective path length here, which is moving around with turbulence. So there are all these problems that complicate this, but you're saved by one thing. And that's that the turbulent atmosphere is reciprocal. So if you come out of a single mode fiber and you go into another single mode fiber, if and only if you do that, 
then it's a fully reciprocal link. And anything that happens to the light going this way happens to the light going this way, whether it be amplitude fluctuations or phase fluctuations. And this is kind of a powerful thing. It depends on the atmosphere being scalar. And there's some really nice papers by Jeff Shapiro talking about it. It's useful in optical comm because basically then you know, if you look here at the signal coming from here, you know if he's getting your signal, you can, you can use that information. But for us, it means that we can use the fact that the time of flight going this way is the same as the time of flight going this way. And again, I want to emphasize if you had multimode fiber, that would break down. So we can do that and basically then do a two-way trick. And this trick is the same as what's done in the RF domain. Uh, what we do is we set each, imagine you have a clock at each site and you have a comb. You send the pulse train this way and on this site you basically set up a femtosecond stopwatch to measure the time interval between the zero to nth pulse here. And you send pulses this way and you do the same thing, measure the time interval. Now if the path length changes, these pulses take longer this way and this way, so these two stopwatches measure a longer time interval. However, if this guy is ticking faster than he ought to be ticking, he sees these pulses coming in too slow, so he measures too long a time interval. And this one, as far as he's concerned, this one's ticking too fast, so he measures too short a time interval, so you get a differential change. So if we can build these femtosecond stopwatches, when we compare their time interval measurements, the path length variation drops out as common mode, and you're left with just the difference in clock timing. And the other nice thing is that you don't need a continuous link. If I take out all the middle of the pulses, I'm okay. So it's compatible with the intermittency of a free space link. You just need something to start and stop your stopwatch. Um, the trick, right, is you have to basically you have everything operate with femtosecond or sub femtosecond, 100 out of second timing. We can do that. We can lock the comb to the clock and maintain that type of timing. Then we still have to build the femtosecond stopwatch and I'll talk about this in detail. Basically, we can do that. We just essentially do a coherent heterodyne reception of one comb with the other. And essentially, this is a time domain version of the dual comb with some modifications. But basically, we set them up so they have a known difference in rep rates. And then you get, when this guy comes over, these pulses walk through. You get a series of interferograms, which are like the ticks on the stopwatch. And their position is highly sensitive to the incoming timing of the pulse train. It's like you built a linear optical sampling scope. And so we can just look at the difference between the spacing of these interferograms to get out the clock difference. Um, and so we've done that experiment. We actually uh, uh, did this a while ago now. Uh, and basically, we had a common clock. We kind of had a ring topology. The clock was down in the lab. We went up, out off the mirror, came in a different window, and went back to the same station. And basically, over this loop, if we do it right, we should see the same timing coming out at our two receivers. Um, and, and we do, this is sort of a timing measurement. It's sub femtosecond, pushing 100 attoseconds beyond 40 femtoseconds out. Actually, our new data comes down is, is even lower. And if I put that in terms of the uh, uh, stability I showed before, the plot got lost, but it's basically running along down here. So at a second and beyond, we're below the optical clocks. Now, the optical clocks, this is an absolute stability. Ours is a residual stability. In fact, our goal is to always be below the clock so we don't mess up the signal. And this is just two kilometers, right? But it is two kilometers through air. Uh, we've gone four kilometers now, and we see no de distance dependence. So our limitation is do totally due to the receivers. So we think if you had st these static terminals, it doesn't matter how far we go, provided we can get light between the two points. Um, I don't think you'd ever build this kind of long distance system just for this, but if you have an optical comm system, you can, you can piggyback this on it, which is the general uh, idea. And right now, this is just a comparison, so we're really moving toward being able to synchronize these, and then you can imagine a kind of optical GPS system. Um, with that, I was just gonna talk just briefly, mainly again, just to show some, some nice pictures uh, about the last thing, which is 3D ranging. So this is a much more applied thing, and, and the comb has less of a role here, but I think it has it can serve an important role. Uh, the idea is to do surface profiling right at a distance. Um, there's a lot of work with sort of structured light, essentially, which can go very fast and generate great images, but they're not traceable in a NIST traceable kind of way. If you can touch the object, that's great. You can measure its shape. And in between, there's a lot of systems based on laser-based ranging, essentially time of flight or frequency modulated systems to look at large-scale metrology. And the minute we see laser-based ranging, we say, well, we can bring a comb in and, and maybe do it better. 
Uh, the other application that kind of intrigued us is forensics, where traceability might matter. Um, it turns out impression evidence, by which I mean, say, footprint and dirt, is still an important deal in forensics because criminals wear gloves, and, and so they're aware of DNA and stuff. Criminals, who are mainly, maybe mainly male, don't have that many pairs of shoes, and they don't want to buy a new pair of shoe every time they commit a crime. So they wear the same pair of shoes to the crime scene, and so it ends up being a very useful uh, uh, forensics tool. And the first one you can find is this museum in Austria in 1903. Here's the first cast of a footprint that was used to convict a, a, a guy in Austria. Uh, and here's a cast of a footprint in 2012 from the Sheriff's Department in Sarasota, Florida. And they're doing the same thing, okay? Obviously, if you could take digital imagery of footprints, you could get lots of them at the scene. You could compare them, do an analysis. I mean, it's an obvious thing to head toward um, if you can get the price down. And you need the traceability. Um, so that's one of the things that was sort of motivating us. Uh, so basically, I won't talk about this in too much detail because it's, it's not too different from existing systems. But basically, we did a comb-calibrated LiDAR system using the so-called FMCW LiDAR approach, which is sort of identical to swept source OCT, just at a distance. And it's just you're just sweeping a laser frequency and looking at the return coherent heterodyne signal. Uh, and we have a scanning mirror, and we basically scan the laser beam across the surface. The thing that's new here is we basically, because we have the comb, we can scan this laser as fast and as hard as we want so we can get data faster and retain the full frequency or timing knowledge to get this distance right. Because when we're scanning it, we calibrate the laser instantaneous frequency by beating it against a comb. And this is actually a simple comb. It's just a mode lock laser. And so basically, we can run at terahertz bandwidths which is a lot of bandwidth and 2,000 points per second, and keep an accuracy that's completely limited by the air path index of refraction. And actually a precision, so a fuzz, which ends up being completely speckle phase noise limited, which took us a while to figure out. Uh, and so we can take these images, which are ultimately the distances here. It's hard to convey in this false color image, but the distance is traceable to the comb T spacing that we measure with an RF clock. So it's sort of a traceable distance measurement. And we can take machine parts. Here's our footprint, right? And you can't really see it in dirt, but in 3D, it really pops out, the treads of the shoe. And there's a worn mark here. Um, that's the shoe that took the footprint. Uh, whoops. I wanted to show you this just because it... Ah, oh, crap. There we go because it took a while to make. So this is the shoe itself. We take a 3D image of it. And this is, I should emphasize, this is at 10 meters distance. So it's taking a picture from across the room. Um, so it's diffraction limited, and we get the full 3D range image. And you can get 3D pictures like this in other systems. It's just they're typically close, and they're typically not mistraceable, calibrated. Um, and then I thought, just because you guys are out here, I'd show you the picture, or a picture of a cactus. <laughs> so. We think this is the highest uh, resolution 3D image of a cactus anybody's bothered to take. Uh, <laughs> that's our moth. Um, uh, so I, the other thing I think I should mention here is this is it's all fiber optics, but it's not cheap enough. But this is fully compatible with, with current chip scale based systems, particularly if you could uh, uh, get some of these other, the, the big optics smaller. Um, so the last thing, just briefly, so these are all um, uh, uh, done with frequency comb in the lab. And in the parallel, we were trying to get a robust comb. Um, and so the problem is, here's our typical lab setup, which is a mess. And we can't just pack that into a box, right? Because fiber is birefringent, and all the temperature, humidity, and vibration screw it up. Uh, so we basically redesigned the system. Um, and that's what's shown here. Uh, it's an all-line polarization-maintaining inline system with an inline interferometer to do the offset frequency detection and detect against the optical. So we lock it in the optical and with the CEO so we can get very quiet combs with femtosecond level jitter, hertz level line widths up here across the, uh, the C, well, across from one to two microns. And then initially we threw it all in this big box, which we actually shook on a shaker table and it retained all its performance. And then we managed to shrink it down to these smaller boxes, which are the size of this laptop, um, at least for the optics package. Uh, and then basically, we've taken the, the uh, initial version of this, and we wanted to do something out of the lab with a comb. So ah, boy, hard to find this mouse. So we put it in this van, 
You can see it's called the Pleasure Way Wagon, uh, which we did not buy with your tax dollars. Um, it, it would belong to the, one of the postdocs, the parents of one of the postdocs. Um, oh, boy, sorry. My computer is working very hard on this. Uh, and we basically just wanted to show we could get the comb in a moving system and keep it phase locked. So here's the comb. Here's an MP photonics fiber laser that we locked to it, right? Not cavity stabilized, so the laser was free running. The point of the exercise was to show the comb would stay locked with radian level noise to it while we bumped across the road. In this system, the electronics are still quite large. We've since shrunk the electronics considerably. Um, and we basically just drove around on this campus. So here's the Hertz wide optical line width of the comb to the CW laser, even when we're driving. And when we go over a speed bump where the person kind of, their iPhone falls off the, the seat. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the comb stays locked throughout, despite the person falling off. And uh, actually we were quite happy because the system stayed phase locked. So the whole system never glitched uh, for the entire 15, 20 minutes drive we drove around until we got bored doing loops in the, at NIST. Um, this is the mesa, the mirror is up there. Um, there's a final plot of the thing. So the accelerometer here actually, the acceleration on here is nothing compared to the shaker table. It was fairly mundane because of the, the shocks on the uh, truck. So um, I want to mention all this work was done with like a lot of people who have actually been in the group for quite a while now, with uh, Laura Sinclair and Ian Coddington, the Comb and Bill Swan and Esther Bauman, Greg Re uh, Greg's now at CU, uh, Fabrizio Giorgetta have all been in the group for a while, and, and Mick and JD and Lindsay and Garwing have joined us. And the greenhouse gas work was done in collaboration with the NOAA group, which is, are the world's experts on greenhouse gas monitoring. They run the Hawaii site, so that's convenient. They're across the street. And of course, we have a lot of optical clockwork at NIST in Dave Wineland's group of the aluminum ion clock we work with closely. And also Scott Didham's group, who's a fellow sort of comb person at NIST. Uh, so with that, I guess I conclude. I mean, basically the idea is these combs, you know, can really provide some unique measurement capabilities and we're really finally pushing them out of the lab. Uh, we're pushing these basic applications where we see it has some real benefit or merit over maybe some existing techniques. Uh, but I think there's, to really hit home, we have to keep driving the cost and the robust down and the robustness up uh, of the comb. Uh, anyway, that's what I had. Thank you. Any questions?